this is the dominance we've come to know from G2. No doubt in your mind that they are the top team in the LEC. Welcome everyone to Inside Esports. I'm Matt Hempstead and we've got all kinds of craziness to chat about today. Before we talk about all the shocking roster moves that happened in the LEC, let's check out the highlights in week number five. Trying to buy a bit of time. Laser has been used, gonna make it a lot easier to contest, but eyes on Inspire, can't make way to the pit. 9k, getting lower and lower. Olaf, can he take it? But no, Broxy manages to get it, but the knockup is there. Lots of the team. It is gonna be an absolute massacre for Fnatic, but they do manage to get the Baron. Hillisang is going to escape. Broxa has the stolen Olaf on set with the leaps into the middle of the team. Hillisang trying to buy a bit of time and just instantly dies. But what is the GA? He will resurrect. Now the stolen Olaf comes in the middle to flash away, though the Laser comes in. Magic Felix says this is my time to shine. Larson, no. Cutting through the entire team. Rover turning the fight. Whippo is fighting a clone. TSM versus Rogue debate ended. Rogue versus Fnatic debate ended. Rogue will find the win. Steel, Kirei goes in, repels up, and he's not there, he still has the flash. Baron down to 2,000, Dan Dan in the pit, and maybe Dan Dan can do it. Look at Neon, he's gonna take the profit, Kirei's dead, but Dan Dan's in there, and the Baron's low, and Dan Dan gets in, and Misfits have somehow found the fight. Absolutely unreal, Wulei now trying to turn around, but there goes Dan Dan. Kirei coming down from the top, he's looking for the flag, it looks like Cocoon, it goes on towards Vanda, he's gonna use the stun there, now Leader goes to the back. Redemption used, it's by goes gold, but Larson and Vanda can't do the damage of the chases, oh, Crescendo used, and now Misfits finds Two. Larson there trying to clear out the way, but look at the damage coming out from Neon. He can't do oh. it. Leader flashes in, and Misfits have done it. Vanda can't defend 1v5, and this is incredible. Misfits change their whole roster and then take the win. Cap's now going to run for his life, wants to take a grab, a grass blade, buy a bit more time, but no wants to turn it instead. Ho oh, ho! Oh. Yeah, but do Splice ever get there? Well, it might not, because Zerse will pull its cast. Is trying to make it out with the Kingslayer? Epstein of Duck will not be enough. Yankos leaps forward. It looks like he might just get taken down, but Perks is the missing team. Hey, Asuo damage is just too much. Kiana will move in for the kill. Oh, no. G2 just clean him up. The triple for Perks. And this is the dominance we've come to know from G2. No doubt in your mind that they are the top team in the LEC. Despite all the changes in the LEC, one thing still remains the same, and that, of course, is G2 being in first place. Tell us understand all these crazy roster swaps that we've got going on. We've got Veteran joining us. How's it going, man? Hey, it's going good. It's going good. Uh, I want to start because you recently tweeted out kind of cryptically that the biggest roster shift is happening this week, right? Yes. And, uh, I mean, eventually we found out that the Misfits premier roster would be starting in the LEC in place of guys like Soaz, Gorilla, Febovin, and it was, it was a huge shock. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, the Misfits results are pretty poor going into the, or going out of the first half. But do you think that this was an overreaction to their struggles? Um, I think that... I, I don't like the impact that it would have on the academy team itself. I feel like it's a very, very high-risk situation for them. Yeah. Obviously, if they're able to uh, pull it off, then sure. But historically speaking, amateur teams that have joined the LEC, even though they have mostly made it to the World Championships, like Splice, like H2K, like the original Misfits roster, their initial split has never actually been that good. Splice actually had one of the worst splits on record uh, in spring before they uh, qualified for Worlds and summer h2k didn't win a game for the first half of their first split uh, but they eventually went to world so the ramp up time needs to be there and that time just isn't available for the academy team so i yeah. i didn't really like the switch because of that uh i think that most of the benefit of the switch is going to be people on the main team uh who want to look for other jobs who don't want their career necessarily to tank too hard by playing out the rest of the split and i think that these five players, if the organization sticks to them, and I really think that they're kind of obligated to at this point, are actually a much better base to build from than the original five roster. Because at least this roster has a genuine cohesive idea on how to play the game, whereas the first roster had a lot of like star power, but it was really a bit of a mess when it comes to synergy and all of that. So. Right, I mean, some of the guys who are no longer part of that team are like Soaz, Gorilla, they're absolute legends. And yes. I mean, now they're not taking part in the LEC. So when you look mm -hmm. at, you know, their results, do you think that guys like Soaz and Gorilla are kind of to blame for what happened? Are they, gonna, are, are they part no. of the scapegoat situation here? 
No, so uh, my line with this roster has always been that there are basically no bad players on the roster. Right. Like, even if you say that uh, players like Gorilla have been disappointing, like, you still can't say that players like Gorilla have been bad. They're just on the wrong team. Like, for example, I feel like if you swapped Ignar and Shulker, uh, Ignar in Shulker for Gorilla and Misfits and just swapped those two supports around, both teams would suddenly be, be, be better because the play styles of those two players are just better for the, for the other teams. I actually think that, in a way, Misfits have always been trying to replace Ignar. They've never, um, they've never had another player that gave them like proper engage calls, like actually went in on these engage windows uh, from the support or jungle world ever since they lost Ignar. And Gorilla just isn't that kind of player. Like Prey always kind of took that role on the Rocks Tigers. Right. Gorilla was always playing like Tom, like he's famous for Janna. They did Juggermore when he was playing Lulu, and at that point you don't even need engage because Cogmore was your front line at the same time <laughs> as your carry is a bit of a disgusting composition uh, but they they never had anybody like this ever since they lost ignar and they could throw all the star power they wanted in here if you're not adding the thing that the team needs and you're just getting better at the stuff the team already has then there's still always something missing you know but the the, the new roster the academy roster it basically just plays one free one but that's like one thing that it can play well at all stages of the game than the main team could even if the players are like they're obviously more inexperienced like leader for example let's say is b tier right now even though i'm really high on leader and i think that leader will be a tier one player next year um dan dan uh his laning phase is lacking but his uh his side laning in mid to late game is very consistent and you saw that net them a win yeah. um these guys actually understand how to play out this specific format properly maybe they're a bit of a one trick but a one trick is better than no trick you know for sure i mean that wasn't the only shocking roster move that we saw this past week i mean it was surprising, but then Fnatic moved Nemesis to AD carry and started Magic Felix mid against Rogue. It was kind of like a, a G2-esque move, where right? You move your mid laner bot and all that jazz. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on Fnatic experimenting uh, with lineups that don't include Reckless? So my understanding of this roster move um, from like the backseat is that, or from like my the information that I have of it, is that it's it's a temporary move. Um, it's not intended to be like a long term thing, yeah. and that there were there was a lot of like backroom politics that actually went into this move. But um, a lot of the issues to do with it are resolved. And if you're a fanatic fan, they have one of the best coaches in the business to win a team is having like a downturn in any sort of way. Um, like I feel like if your team is behind young buck is probably the best coach that you could possibly have there i don't want to go too much more into it because i don't want to seem like i'm taking sides of whatever was going on right. with the players and stuff but like this is like a temporary thing is my understanding you'll just be back to like regular fanatics soon enough and that's a fanatic that looks like a solid top three team right now though obviously splice are, are like adapting yeah. and look like they are actually the dark horse now like them being a dark horse is no longer a meme like they could actually maybe knock someone out well, in the game that Fnatic actually played without Reckless, they ended up losing to Rogue. Mm -hmm. And Rogue is a team that seems to be on the rise, even though they did lose to uh, the Misfits Academy team. How yes. do you think Rogue has been able to come together? And currently, they sit in a tie for six, which is pretty impressive for them. Yeah, so I think a large amount of this is that Larson has gotten more and more comfortable on stage and has actually started shot calling a lot more, is my understanding. Um, and you can really see the benefits of this when you saw them basically match Fnatic's uh, tried and true strategy of dragging Hillisang to mid and Broxer to mid and then shoving them to top. They could never really do that because uh, Vander and Inspired were able to match them on all of those rooms towards the midsection. And Larson plays like really solidly, like a rock. Um, like if, if he's going to be the next someone in Europe, he's probably going to be the next Foggen. Not this what? idea of Foggen that people have where he just like sits on the tower and farms, but the actual idea of Foggen, <laughs> which is that he just controls mid properly and plays absurdly consistency, consistently. Um, and if Larson is also bringing uh, the shot calling stuff which is what my information uh is telling me then he then he's also giving himself insane longe longevity in the scene like players like hi for example yeah. who maybe were never mechanically strong uh, were able to stay in the scene for longer because they had that shot calling aspect and this kind of communication especially for the way the game is played now with so much emphasis on mid priority from teams like Fnatic, uh is is 
really beneficial to Rogue. I still think they're going to hit a wall when they come up against really strong bot lanes that will prevent the support from being able to roam just through sheer pressure. I don't think either of the AD carry players are too up to par. Um, but I do think that right now, a really strong midsection with Larson, a really promising rookie talent with Inspired. He's the yeah. youngest player on all major regions. Um, and maybe his early game plans are a bit off, but the way that he reacts to stuff on the map is insane, actually, for a player that is that young at this stage of his career. It's really, really promising. It's inspiring, you could say. Um, so <laughs> the mid jungle there, I think, is like a huge source of strength for them right now. Uh, and that's what won them versus Fnatic. I don't think that had anything to do with the uh, Nemesis being swapped to AD carry or anything like this. I actually think Fnatic just got matched in a strategy that they would use um, even if they had uh, Reckless on the team and Nemesis mid. I actually don't think they would have been able to get the strategy off anyway. I think this was a strategic victory for Rogue. Well, adding on to Rogue, I mean, there was a whole lot of discussion about uh, coming out on Twitter and Reddit between Rogue and TSM, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The head coach of Splice said uh, that yes. Rogue would beat TSM 8 out of 10 times, and that started a whole yeah. like, salt fuel debate. So I want to get your take. Do you think that Rogue is a better team than TSM? I think that the fundamentals that Rogue Express are uh, already better fundamentals than any North American team expressed at uh, Rift Rivals. Their execution is not as strong as uh, long-term teams like Team Liquid, for example, but I think that it's like the Misfits situation, right? Like, uh, Misfits starting roster, sure, really star-studded, uh, these players have been around for a while, lots of experience, etc. But fundamentally, they don't really like get have a complete game plan in the way that the academy team does in the same way uh all these north american teams the top tier ones they've always fundamentally lacked a critical understanding of how to play the game in a complete sense i don't think rogue lacks that critical understanding so i think that over time uh i i would Basically, in the length of a league, if Rogue made it to the World Championships and were against TSM, I would put my money on Rogue, for sure. Um, if you put them versus TSM at the start of this split, uh, I probably wouldn't, but that would be on the fact that I think Rogue would execute worse, rather than that I thought Rogue misunderstood something about League of Legends relative to TSM, you know? This is why I'll basically always bet on the European team versus the North American team. The only teams that seem to, like, adapt and try to do some sort of crazy shit to counter the fact that they don't like the fundamentals is uh, Cloud9. And I think this is a big reason why Cloud9 have been able to succeed internationally. Yeah. Like the way that they played against the Freaker Freaks, they basically just started skirmishing from minute one to, to then force the Freaker to react to that, you know? Then it doesn't matter if a Freaker's understanding of the game is better than Cloud9's because they're now they're now bogged down in the trenches with Cloud9, you know? They just yeah. drag you down to their level. So, I mean, I mean, TSM's only a middle of the team pack right now in NA anyway, so it's kind of an irrelevant question. Um, so, you mentioned Splice <laughs> earlier, right? They were, they're sitting in third yeah. right now. We know they can play textbook really well, but do you think that's enough to beat teams like G2 or Fnatic? Do you think they'll be able to surpass one of them at the end of summer? The Fnatic game was very promising because they tried to match Fnatic's early strategy. The same thing that Rogue did to beat Fnatic, basically Splice did as well. Um, there have been a lot of analysts that are out of step with like the fan base in terms of a lot of us think that Fnatic's early game is like a very set solid thing uh, that's actually open to abuse because it's very predictable what they do and the Splice and Rogue games are, I, I would kind of use as evidence for that but the fact that Splice are matching them early game is very interesting because normally Splice have just been the quintessential will allow Kobe to farm for free items and then will team fight kind of team you know like did this is the kind of thing that got Kobe like a deathless season on a split on vein you know right. um but now they're playing like with aggressive early game plans sure it was one time but that's like one more bit of adaptation than I've seen even out of Fnatic you know Fnatic haven't changed their style at all but this is a dramatic shift from Splice and that's really promising if they come into more games with more early game plans and keep experimenting with that then then yeah I think that they could knock out one of the big daddies obviously origin uh is on the downswing right now but uh, i think that in playoffs that might not necessarily be so relevant um fanatic quite clearly have a hole in them 
and then we'll get on to G2, to be honest. But, like, there <laughs> is room for them to be able to make it in. They've at least proven they can beat Fnatic, and Origin are clearly vulnerable right now. So maybe Splice can make it in and be one of the world's teams. I, I actually think that they could do it. I also have to shout out Humanoid, who is proving everybody wrong who thought that they uh, that he was a below nemesis, who thought that he was even below Abadage towards the start of the split. This guy has been the most promising of all these rookie talents since the start of the split, in my opinion. And now it's just obvious to people. Now you would just be dumb to say that he isn't. Even if, obviously, Caps could, like, get one over him in the laning phase in the G2 game. But that's, like, we're talking about the best mid laner in the world there. Humanoid isn't quite there yet. But I think Humanoid is definitely pushing for top three in Europe right now. And I'm, I'm really happy for him. Yeah, it's kind of hard to argue with that the way Splice is playing right now. Uh, veteran, we always yep. appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much for joining us today. Chat LEC. Okay. No problem.